My name is Dr. Michelle Dickinson. Oh. I've learned that breaking things down is the easiest way to understand them. So join me. We'll break down scientific concepts, meet some amazing scientists and inventors, and help you discover the world around you. Kia ora. I'm Dr. Michelle Dickinson, and today we're going to be talking about mixtures. Mixtures are everywhere you look. The rocks on the ground you stand on, the ocean that you swim in, and the atmosphere that surrounds our planet are all mixtures. A mixture is defined as a substance made by combining two or more different materials in a way that no chemical reaction occurs. There are different types of mixtures, and by the end of today's episode, you will know the different types, as well as how atoms and molecules make up different mixtures. We'll also do an experiment to separate the colors from pens. To do the experiments with me, you'll need a couple of colors of felt tip pens. The darker, the better, but not a permanent marker. Also, a paper towel and some water. And of course, don't forget your notebook and your pen so you can write down your observations. If you haven't got those to hand, go grab them now. A bit later in the show, I'll be checking in with one of my science helpers who'll be joining us from home and speaking to one of my friends who'll be able to tell us even more amazing things about their research into molecules. Okay, let's get started. We are surrounded by stuff, and scientists call that stuff matter. All the things that are around you, the paper, the pens, the television, or the computer, are all made up of matter. Matter is made up of atoms, which are the basic building blocks of the universe. Atoms are made up of protons, which have a positive charge, electrons, which have a negative charge, and neutrons that are neutral. There are lots of different types of atoms. Something which is made from one type of atom is called an element. We're still discovering new elements, but right now there are 118 different elements. Some of these are natural, and some of them have been created by people. Oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, calcium, and iron are all elements. Two or more elements joined together can form a molecule, which have properties that are different to the pure elements they are made from. In chemistry, when we talk about mixtures, we mean the combination of two or more different materials in a way that no chemical reaction occurs. We can usually separate a mixture back into its original components. I'll show you. Here, I've got two different items, chocolate chips and marshmallows. So we can create a mixture by pouring them together. And there you have a mixture of both. You can easily see that they are two very different things. And while separating them may take a while, it actually is relatively easy. There are no chemical bonds between the marshmallow and the chocolate, so we can separate them back out again. And once they've been separated, they are still the same marshmallows and still the same chocolate chips as they were before they were mixed together. So they haven't changed at all, either chemically or physically. Oil and why, or water, is another example of a mixture, and one that doesn't mix very easily. So if I grab some water and some oil, and I pour the oil into the water, you should be able to see that they form two separate layers. As oil is less dense than water, it lies on top of the water. And oil molecules are also non-polar, meaning that they have no charge. So they are more attracted to each other than to the water molecules. So let's try and mix these two together. I'll take a spoon and mix them. So you can see that while it looks like they're mixing, actually, they're not. And you can see that the oil is already starting to separate. So the oil formed tiny little drops which then start to group together as they float to the top. And we can see that within a couple of seconds, we already have that separation again of the oil and the water. Now, one type of mixture is called a solution. And this is where one substance is dissolved into another. 
We can mix salt and water, for example, to make salt water. However, unlike the oil and water, leaving it for a few hours won't result in the salt floating up to the top. We can still separate the two by boiling the mixture. The water will evaporate off, leaving the salt crystals at the bottom of the pot. The ability of being able to get the salt back out of the water makes it a mixture. And the ability to dissolve salt into water makes it a solution, which is a type of mixture. Solutions can also be gases dissolved into liquids, like carbon dioxide dissolved into water makes carbonated water, which you might know as soda water. There are lots of solids that are mixtures too, although it's much easier to mix them in their liquid state. An alloy, for example, is a mixture of two or more metals or other elements, which have to be melted to mix together. Bronze is an alloy made of copper and tin. People discovered bronze over 5,000 years ago. Again, an alloy is a type of mixture because we can separate out the pure metals from each other. So for bronze, we could separate the copper from the tin by heating the bronze until it melts. We've talked a lot about mixtures, including how we know something is a mixture and how we make and separate out the different parts of a mixture. But what if you can't separate the materials out? Then you might have what's called a compound. A compound is different to a mixture because in a compound, once you add one thing to another thing, a chemical bond is formed and you can't get the original materials back out again. An example of a compound is a cake. When we mix together the ingredients for a cake batter and then bake it, the heat from the oven creates a chemical reaction which turns raw cake batter into a delicious cooked cake. And you can never get out the raw flour, eggs or butter again. That's one of the main differences between a mixture and a compound. Now we've learnt about mixtures, let's do an experiment together where we're going to separate a mixture into some of its components. And the mixture that we're going to separate is ink from a felt tip pen. We're going to do it using a process called chromatography. Turn up where you're back, eh? Hello. Kia ora. Thank you so much for helping with my experiment today. It's a pleasure to be with you. Okay, so let's take a look at your pens. What colour do you have? I have pink, brown and purple and green. Okay, so we're going to do an experiment to see what's actually inside your pens. So can you tear your paper towels? So you've got four pens, let's do it into four pieces. I've got two pens, I'm going to do mine into two pieces. Three and then four. Done. Okay, perfect. Now for each one, colour in a circle about three centimetres or so near the corner and fill it in. So each one has its own coloured felt tip pen. Perfect, so you should have circles on your paper towel. Mm -hmm. Now take each paper towel and dip the corner into your water. Okay. And then lay it down to dry. Okay, done. Perfect. You should be able to see that where the water is touching them, the colours are starting to spread out. And so your ink is starting to dissolve into the paper. Can you see that? Mm-hmm, I see that. And what's actually happening is we're dissolving the mixture of felt tip pens, which is actually made up of inks of different colour. And they're going to travel through the paper towel. So we're going to watch this as the paper towel absorbs the water and it's going to take the ink with it. So we're going to leave this for about five minutes and then we're going to come back to it and take a look at our colours, okay? Okay. Okay, Valky, now they've had a bit of time to dry out. Do your circles still look like circles or are they like mine in that they're just blobs of colour? They spread out drastically. So, Rake, can you hold it up and see if there are any different colours on there? Sure. Mm -hmm. And what colour was that one before? Uh, that was more of just um, brown, just basically brown. Mm -hmm. And what about now? Now it looks more like an orange and red. And so that's the secret of felt tip pens. They're not always the colour you think there are. They're made of a mixture of totally different colours and we can separate those out using this. And what we just did here is something called chromatography. Mm. 
And actually we use chromatography all the time in science to separate out different mixtures. And so this was a black pen and you can see that it's actually made up of red and blue and green. Yeah. And your pens, as you can see, are made up of all of those different mixed colors too. Yeah, that's interesting. So there you go, your felt tip pen isn't actually the color that you think it is. It's just a mixture of other colors. Well, now I have to rethink on what I buy. <laughs> hey Belki, thank you so much for helping me today. See you later. Bye. Okay, after any experiment, we need to write down our observations. These help us to understand our results and make interesting predictions for our next experiments. So, our observations, what did we see? We saw that when the ink spot got wet, the colour started to move along the paper. We saw that the pango, or the black ink, separated out into different colours, including kikarangi, or blue, and ferro, red. We also saw that the blue moved the furthest along the paper and the red moved the least. Then we look at our observations and reflect on them by asking questions about why something happened or how we might make it happen again. We're really starting to understand the science behind it when we do this. From this experiment, we are able to conclude that the blue ink in our pen actually has the smallest molecules because it was able to travel the furthest. And therefore, the red ink must have the largest molecules because it traveled the least. But the question is, is this the same in all of the types of felt tip pen that you could try? So maybe try doing this experiment again using different brands of black ink felt tip pen or different colors to see if the same inks travel in the same way. We could also make sure that the paper towels are all the same lengths and time how long it takes to reach the end of the paper. If we do that, then we can also calculate the rate that the diffusion is happening at. Okay, now we have a little bit more understanding about how to separate molecules out. We're going to talk to an expert in chemistry about their research. Dr. Yudranka Travis Sedich is a principal investigator at the McDiamond Institute and a fellow of the Royal Society Te Aparangi. Her research looks at conductive polymers and combining molecules in new ways. Hi, Drunka, how are you? Hello, Michelle, I'm great, thank you. So for everybody at home, can you just introduce yourself, please? My name is Jadrunka Travarsedic, um, and I'm professor in chemistry at the University of Auckland. I'm also a director of, the, uh, of a university centre called Polymer Bio Interface Centre, and I am a principal investigator of the McDermott Institute for advanced materials and nanotechnology. <laughs> so I know that you are really busy and we have been learning all about mixtures today and what mixtures are from a chemistry point of view. And so we're gonna to chat to you a little bit about your research and a little bit about chemistry. But before that, can you tell me about your childhood? Did you want to be a scientist growing up? I did, I, I, I knew I loved, loved science from a very early age. Um, I had a wonderful teacher in science when I was uh, 12, 14 years old who really sparked that love for science for me. So can you tell me a little bit about your research? So what my research group is working on at the moment, it's making electronic materials that are made of soft polymers. So in some, some of those materials also can self-heal. Uh, so if they are stretched or damaged, they can repair. So self-healing materials are really interesting. So to be able to just make self-healing materials, do you mix different chemicals together? So it's interesting because basically our approach to stretchable electronics is slightly different. We actually put them together into one single molecule. So this is what's unique about what you do. You make what's called conductive polymers. And we've talked about polymers before in a previous episode, which is just another word for plastics. But when we talk about plastics, we used to say that plastics didn't conduct electricity, but you're making ones that do, is that right? Yes, yeah, so, so this is a... You can, you can say new class of polymeric material. So as you said, for long, uh, people thought that uh, plastics doesn't uh, conduct electricity, that it's uh, insulating. But from the late 70s, uh, it was discovered that um, some pl plastics actually can conduct electricity. And as you know, there, is, uh, there was one of the scientists that who discovered uh, conductivity in plastics. It was New Zealander, Professor Alan McDermott. And what do you enjoy most about your job? 
uh, what I'm enjoying the most about my job, it's uh, uh, definitely brainstorming with my research students, with my collaborators and colleagues, uh, you know, about how we are going to address uh, some of the challenges uh, that today's society is facing. And can you sum up your research in just one sentence? Uh, my research is uh, about making novel advanced materials that uh, are very useful in uh, medical applications. So anything from, uh, from biosensors to maybe implantable electronic materials. And before we go, can you give me one fact about your research that you wished people already knew? An awesome thing about my, my job and what I do every day is that every day is different. Uh, that it's uh, this field that I work in, it's a really fast moving field. Uh, and it's an interface in between various fields like chemistry and uh, materials and engineering and, and medicine. Yudranka, that was so fascinating. Thank you so much for your time today. One of the most important mixtures to us as humans is the one that we create and carry inside our bodies, blood. Blood is a mixture of lots of different things that we need to sustain life. Plasma, red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, salt, and water. The platelets, red blood cells, and white blood cells are carried along in the plasma, which is the liquid part. Plasma itself is something called a colloid, which is another type of mixture. So it's basically a mixture within a mixture. Biotechnologists and bioengineers have been working on creating artificial blood for some time. We've been trying to perfect the recipe for artificial blood since the Second World War, when there were a huge number of injured people who needed blood transfusions. So the invention of artificial blood was a truly life-saving mixture. The trouble is that real blood does so many jobs in our body, and to the best of our ability, artificial blood can't yet do all of the things that natural blood can do. For example, artificial blood is very good at carrying oxygen and carbon dioxide around our bodies, but it's not so good at removing waste products like nitrates from our tissues and taking them down to our kidneys. The mixtures we put into artificial blood are slowly getting better. For example, we can create artificial hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a molecule in red blood cells that helps to transport oxygen to our muscles. Our ability to create synthetic hemoglobin is what makes artificial blood a great oxygen carrier. But scientists are still working on fine tuning it as to be as efficient as our natural hemoglobin, which has 98% oxygen carrying efficiency, it still has a long way to go. If we can get it right, there are all sorts of advantages to using artificial blood. For example, it can help to reduce the amount that we need to rely on people to give blood donations. It can be engineered to be accepted by people of all blood groups, and it can be stored for longer than natural blood can. Artificial blood could help people to recover from disease and infection, access life-saving blood transfusion, and save lives in an emergency. The bioengineers of the future will need to address these challenges and many more in the quest to find the perfect mixture. New research is being done to find new elements as well as create new mixtures all the time. And there's so much more to discover, not just about the mixtures that we already have, but also how to create new mixtures that can help solve challenges in the world. Teachers and parents, don't forget to visit nanogirlslab.com where we have downloadable content to help you continue on your science journey into the wonderful world of mixtures. Thanks for watching. Is a cup of tea a mixture? Why are rocks mixtures? What pure metals do we find in nature? How does dishwashing liquid clean oil off plates if oil doesn't mix with water? Is slime a mixture? If a baked cake is a compound, does that mean that raw cake batter is also a mixture? How do people come up with new paint colours? Is there a limit to how much salt will dissolve into water? Why do we make alloys? Are there metals which can't be combined together?